Is that the motor for the car back there? Yeah, I was working on it today, so I'm going to start okay. that content soon. You know, I'm just going to take a break from motorcycles for a second and work on this. Yeah. Because I've been oh. wanting to do it for 15 years, so. <laughs> well, it looks like it looks like it's in good shape. I mean, what kind of car is it? So it's a 70 Chevelle. Oh, okay. And that is an 05 Chevy truck, 5.3 motor. So it's going to be fuel injected, and I'm going to slap a turbo on it. 500, oh, dude, 500 nice. horse. That's what I'm shooting for. <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome back to show episode number four of the Broken Moto Show. And this show is all about myself, Matt, and Cody. And we answer tech questions that you guys submit. Cody, why don't you tell them the rules and the email? All right. The list of rules are that it has to have in the email or the video or the picture included some information. Okay. I'm trying to nail these questions out. Answering questions through email is not the best route, but it's a helpful route. So to make it more helpful, we need stuff like the year, the make, the model. Uh, mileage is very helpful. What was the last thing you worked on? What are the things that you've replaced? You know, as much information as possible helps us out. It gives us something to chew on. Um, we can kind of go back and forth through the notes that you provide. Videos are really cool. We can share them on here. If you do, we found that if we, you do make a video or you put it on YouTube, Make sure that in the details or when you're actually uploading it that we are able to download that video. It makes it a little bit easier for us. We've noticed that it's kind of a struggle to get that content onto here, but that's what it is. The email for this whole establishment is askbrokenmoto at gmail.com. That's how you get a hold of us. So anything else you need to add, Matt? Yeah, a couple of announcements, all right? Number one, happy birthday, dude. It's mm. Cody's birthday today and look where he is. Yeah. That's hardcore. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. And then also in the last episode, I felt like I gave Noob a hard time. Yeah. And I want to share a story so you can laugh at me and then mm. we'll level things out. Okay. I actually have one I can share too. Maybe oh, okay. Great. Yeah. And I, I think we were laughing because I, I said Biff and then you started giggling. Oh, that's exactly why we were laughing. Yeah, I think we were just laugh, <laughs> laughing at the word Biff, not because the noob fell, okay? I mean, right. hey. absolutely. All right, so we got time for a story? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so <laughs> I have an 01 KX250, and one day I come out here, and uh, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, it looks pretty dusty. I should get on it and ride it, right? So I'm in gym shoes, shorts, and a T-shirt, and I throw on my helmet. I hop on the thing. And we have some power lines not far from here. And, you know, it's just a straight grassy uh, stretch. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, I'll just rip it around a little bit. And I decide to do some wheelies, right? So doing a wheelie, I'll bump in first. I hit second while I'm in the air. Why not? And then I hit third. I'm like, all right. And then it's coming up, up. <laughs> it's going a little sideways. And guess what happened next? You biffed it. I biffed it. I, <laughs> I looped it out, dude. I was probably going 25, maybe more. And, and I just, I couldn't find, <laughs> I couldn't find the back brake pedal yeah. like footing. And it was, and I just had to let go. Right. <laughs> the ground was so dry and hard and I slid on my ass <sighs> and my elbow. And dude, I had a road rash spot like this big and it, Oh man, oh, man. <laughs> bent my bars and Dang it. uh yeah it was stupid so it was there a you solid go solid biff solid it was, biff. It was, yeah <laughs> that's right so noob i'm i i apologize now you know i biff as well <laughs> so it's things you got to look back on i remember when i had uh i had my first i cuz i grew up riding dirt bikes too i had my first bike that I got from the shop, someone had like wanted to get the bike repaired and they didn't have enough money. So it ended up like being like, you know what? I'll just keep the bike. You don't have to pay me for the repairs, whatever. It was a piece of junk, but it was a 750 shadow. Okay. okay. Uh, twin car model, 750 shadow. Um, I had painted all up all black and it was all nice. Cause it was like purple from the original owner. And um, I've been riding it for a while, you know, and uh, one night day after church on Sunday, I was like, babe, I got to ride up to the shop. And in front of our shop is about a quarter mile, just a flat. Actually, all okay. goes kind of downhill towards the railroad tracks. And 
I'm out there on my Sunday's best, not, not like suit and tie, you know, but like in nice slacks that my wife had uh, gotten for me and they were new actually. I remember that. And I'm um, pulling out of the shop, went in there and grabbed something, came out. And I was like, you know, I see people doing those rolling burnouts all the time, you know, like, <laughs> so I, I, I gotta let this thing rip and try this out. Right. And I'm trying to do it. I'm not really getting into it for a second. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm at like a stop. Right. So I, I'm not doing it while I'm rolling. I'm doing it from a stop. I'm just trying to do a burnout. Okay. And I rev it up, boom, 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 and dump the clutch. And all of a sudden it starts to go. And I'm like, oh, it's going, it's going. And all of a sudden it like, it goes this way and then hooks. And that's all I remember. Right. It was yeah. like sideways like this. And then it was like, boom. And before, after that, I was on the ground looking at my bike, like over there. And I was like, <laughs> oh man. And I jacked up the pan. I, so I had, to, I had to pick the bike up ride it back to the house like babe i dropped the bike she's like what were you doing i was like i was trying to do a rolling burnout it was gonna be <laughs> sweet <laughs> but dude that was my oh. first bike and it happened man you know yeah i mean what can you do yeah it and happens you, you pick it up and you keep on going so yeah all right you doing the so, first question or am uh, i doing why don't you go ahead and rock the first question out all right first question hey cody and matt Congrats on the new series and thanks for the opportunity to ask. My name is Frank from Maryland and I looked this up. It looks like it's in Oklahoma. Oh, okay. I have a 94 CBR 1000. It's a Honda that's been sitting for about three years in storage. I bought a new battery, removed, cleaned, and reinstalled the carbs. The only way she turns over is if I use starting fluid. A couple of seconds after she starts, she shuts back off. What am I missing? Thanks, Frank. All right, so clearly it's it's a fuel delivery issue because yep. when you hit it with starting fluid, it starts right up. So um, I would look at to see if the carbs fill with fuel. Is, is fuel pouring out of the fuel line, out of the fuel tank and filling up the carburetors? Um, now, he, he mentions that, I mean, it doesn't say choke or no choke, but I would think that, you know, the choke passages are pretty large, so it yeah. should run on choke, but he didn't even state that. So if it's getting fuel, then I have some bad news. Those carbs got to come off and you probably missed cleaning the most important part, which is the pilot jets and actually removing the physical fuel screws and cleaning that passage really well exactly. um, to exactly. get it to run. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's what I found is the number one thing people miss the most is that passage or they'll, they don't take those out. They don't take, like, they won't take the choke assemblies out or the wrenching or the plungers out. They'll take the bowls off, take all the jets out, blow through them, maybe blow through the body, but they don't take the mixture screws out or the plungers. And they're right. leaving a, 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 a whole system right there that's not being activated. Right. Um, it, yeah, that, it's definitely a carburetor, okay? Because starting fluid's telling you a number of things, as we stated before, compression. There's something there to allow it to try to fire up. Because it sounds like it's saying you, it's, it won't turn over unless you're starting fluid. Which I'm thinking that you're saying that it won't. It's it's trying to start. Like it's turning over is not the issue. It's it trying to start, and it does start with starting fluid, and then that tells you you know that it's not. It's probably not valve timing. It's probably not uh, spark. It's probably not compression. Um, fuel delivery just like Matt said I was trying to Google real quick which we, again we I, mean, I didn't do before we looked at these <laughs> questions um, which means that we're not following the rules yeah and <laughs> and um, I couldn't see that it had a fuel pump uh, some of those do have external I'm, I wouldn't want to say that the 1000 is not just gravity fed um, but it's likely it could also be vacuum operated Right. Okay. Cause it's a big honking fuel valve that's feeding like two half inch lines into the front of those carburetors. There's like two inlets, I believe. And then they kind of fork into one and then that goes to, to the fuel valve itself, or it goes to an external fuel pump. Right. Because usually on the CBRs, you got the tank that sits like a turtle. Shell sure. Yeah. The carbs, are, the carbs are like right here. Right. right they're up high. Exactly. Yeah. So fuel pumps needed. That's why those are there. Might not have one though. It might be gravity fed. If it's gravity fed, make sure that if, if it's, it's not vacuum operated. If it's vacuum operated, I have a video on that checking vacuum operation fuel valve. But I think Matt's spot on. It's going to be um, 
uh, slow speed circuit issue. Yeah. Now, if you can't find the fuel screws, I don't know if this model has it or not, but sometimes they put welch plugs or caps yep. over the fuel screws. And again, we didn't look it up and that wouldn't be in the parts diagram anyway. Um, I'm going to say that it does have fuel mixture screws and they are not plugged. Okay. And they should be facing like right where they go into the throttle bodies. I mean, into the intake ports. They're like, it's like the little dink hanging down right there. Um, it's probably, it's more than likely a D-shaped bit. You got to take them out. You got to take them out. You got to soak the bodies. You got to soak the bodies. Yeah. It sucks to pull carbs off twice. It does. It does. I mean, I'd rather pull carb set off of an inline four than a V4 any day, you know? So yeah, luckily they're all right there. They're all, it's a pain in the butt, but especially when you have people who do the carbs and you have to tell them again, you have to do the carbs again. Yeah. It's always difficult soaking them in a more mixture. Um, I think you uh, use a certain mix. I've, I have an ultrasonic tank that's from, and I use the Omega Sonic cleaner from ultrasonic, right? Yeah. But people, I think, do great with the 50-50 uh, mix of um, Simple Green yep. and water, right? Yeah, and that's funny because we actually have a question on that later oh, somewhere. Sweet. I don't know if it's in this episode or next episode, but yeah. Yeah, okay. ultrasonic cleaners are great. Not even saying that that's the silver bullet because – I've cleaned, especially a three-year-old sitting bike. I mean, I'm, we have, I have a, a very nice tank and I, ha I still have to go through everything after I get it out. Uh, and it's not just like, cool, it's been soaked. I'm gonna wash it off, put the jets in and good to go. I have to go through every port again because it's not perfect. It's not, a, it, it's, it's not you know, like I said, the, the silver bullet. It just helps yeah. for the things that you can't see. Yeah, cool. I think we beat that one up pretty yep. well. Cool. All right, on to the next. Let's see. So this one is right here. Hi. I want to add some accessories to my 2016 Harley Sportster 48. Don't know what that is. It's got two wheels though. So I've been told that some of them aren't possible because of the CAN, can C-A-N-B-U-S system. For we non-electricians, could you explain the system in layman's terms and then say what typically can't be added and what can? Thanks, Chris. I'm in SoCal. Chris in SoCal. Thanks for the thanks for that uh, question. So, um, CAN bus system. So I actually was in school uh, for Honda when they have new courses come out. I had to uh, get sent out to a, a training facility to train on new systems, and Honda just introduced the CAN bus system on the new gold wing. So the CAN bus system is actually being used in all in a bunch of cars. So if your car has like a GPS screen on it and you can do a bunch of stuff with it, um, not as complex as like Tesla's, you know, but just like a nice navigation, you got navigation, music, audio, and that's all CAN bus system. And all it really is in layman's terms is it's a nervous system for the bike that has way less wires than a normal harness would have. So they're able to send dedicated signals. So multiple different signals on one wire, which is pretty crazy. So when you're talking about going from ECU to ECU, instead of having a 32 pin ECU connecting to another 64 pin ECU, which then connects to a 30, you know, you're talking about an insane harness. So they're able to connect each of those ECUs to talk to each other through one or two, usually it's two lines. You have a high line and a low line. One has a higher voltage, and I think one, it's slipping me right now, but I, either the one's the ground and one's the high line or the low and the high are just two separate voltage inputs, and the ground is something different, right? But it's, so it's not like your ECU is connected with just two wires. It's just that the, the way that they talk, and this is usually, hopefully this is going to answer your question. This is usually going to be for a more complicated system. So when it comes to like TPMS, um, electronic suspension, uh, uh, airbag models, ABS, um, those big module type systems, the CAN bus is going to be used. It's not necessarily being used for like your turn signals or your brake lights because it's not as uh, dedicated of a system that needs certain input signals to say, hey, lock the rear brake up or don't lock the rear brake up or, or whatever, you know what I mean? Or fire the airbag, you know, like those important dedicated signals, they didn't want to make it 
have a crazy wire harness. So the, actually, the CAN bus system is the same if you're into audio engineering. So like, like on mixing boards, same thing. So like post fader, pre fader, if you know what I'm talking about, like they have dedicated lines to where you can change frequency and EQ and all this stuff. That's, those are our dedicated lines that you can adjust. So it's the same type of deal. So layman's terms, don't mess with it. Okay, find out which wires your CAN bus system is and don't touch it. It's not meant to be messed with. It's not meant to be cut, re-spliced and reused. Um, they don't, like you will jack the bike up if you do that, okay? Because you, again, you have certain ECU, certain modules requiring certain voltages. It's not just like 12 volts all the time. It's like, no, this one needs eight volts. This one needs 2.3, you know, it's, it's different. So find out which wires are those, get a wiring dramatic, wiring dramatic, a wiring schematic, and then figure out what your system looks like. Um, if you have that new of a bike, it's likely gonna be some type of online system, um, like, like manual wise, see if you can buy a manual from them, find out what the CAN bus wires are, ask the technicians if you can at the shop. Um, Hondas, I believe they have a white wire and a red wire, high and low, don't mess with it. I haven't messed with it, we haven't tried to mess with it, we don't want to mess with it. It's just a system that they're designing, so A, people can stop dicking their bikes up, and B, it makes it a lot easier to diagnose when it comes to saying that module is bad, that module is bad versus saying there's something in the harness that's bad. You know what I mean? The CAN bus is just a more dedicated system. So, dude, that's it. That's, I just vomited <laughs> Yeah, CAN bus. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any experience with CAN bus. And um, I did have like a newer Harley in here to rate, you know, put in some big bars on it. And I had to de-pin a bunch of connectors so I could fish the new wires in. Um, I believe the CAN bus was running up to the bars for like the cruise control and yep. other stuff. So that's my experience with it. Depinning a connector and putting it back. Just that's it. Right. So just don't splice into it. Yeah. Yeah. Now that, that, that makes total sense. If it was to the cruise control, that's one of those systems. Yeah. That's it. Boom. All right. Bombs dropped. All right. Next question. question three. Yeah. Rock it out. All right. Hello, my name is Robert. I have an 83 Honda Sabre 750. After I go for a drive and get it to operating temp and then park the bike when I go to restart it after it's been sitting for 30 minutes, it just cranks and won't start unless I hold it wide open while cranking. After 20 cranks, wide open throttle, it'll fire. Uh, I'm going to have to guess... <laughs> You need to install a hot start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that it's it's flooding somehow. There's excess fuel, and you're holding it wide open to introduce air and get it to start. Or maybe there's not enough fuel, and you're cranking, you're holding it wide open, and uh, you're getting fuel and air, and it's starting. I I don't know either scenario, but it sounds like it's a fueling issue maybe unless you're going to go ignition cody i'm going to i'm going to take this on a different level go so for it go for I it i like i like the fuel idea cuz that's what I, that's what you would i would want to go to first is thinking that's rich right um so that year uh 83 saber 750 so this is going to be i think it's a v4 or it's a twin okay can you google it real quick yeah, let me look it up. So the 750s, they have a starter that's mounted right behind the rear cylinder, if this is the one I'm thinking about. Um, so what I think is that when he's holding the throttle wide open, right, you're ultimately, I would say you're allowing the motor to turn through faster. But what I've found and what I've done is that the starters on these things drag excessively over a long period of time, right? The bearings in the bottom or whatever's going on in the starter. Likely you won't be able to find a brand new one from Honda. It's gonna be aftermarket and it probably won't fit until you make it fit, just FYI. But you're gonna, when you go to start the bike up with the starter and the starter is taking so much because of the resistance that's built up inside the starter that it's robbing from the, you said it, Matt, the ignition. And it's robbing power from the coils. Um, when you're holding it open, you're allowing it to spin through a little bit faster, which is kind of like um, making up for the lack of spark 
when you're turning it over because the starter is dragging so excessively. I found that on that specific bike. Did you ever find out what kind of motor? Yeah, so it's a V4. V4, yeah. So I found out on that type of motor um, or that setup, when that's taking place, that's what it was. It was the starter dragging and then robbing power from the coil. So So when you say dragging, you mean like a slow crank? Yes. Okay. Like uh like on the the on starters, the very end, like the head of it, where there's like the little brass bearing or the bushing. Okay. The very bottom, those wear out and then it the it's spinning is is causing it to um like have a high resistance. Right. And then that's drag and like that's robbing a bunch of um, power from the battery. I'm almost curious if, if that happens, right? If he rides it around and brings it back to his garage and have a, a, like a car battery ready to go or a brand new battery ready to go. If he just hooks the battery up to it real quick before he tries to wide open throttle and does all that stuff, just try to kick it with a brand new battery, like jumping straight to it and see if it doesn't fire right up. It's funny you mention that because this, this car back here, this Chevelle, used to have a big old school starter and this thing has headers on it. So you'd go drive it around and the headers would heat soak the starter, uh, increase the resistance, and mm -hmm. then you go you go to fill up gas or whatever you get in, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, <laughs> And like wait for it to cool down and then it'll be fine. Well, what I did is I asked the gas guy, gas attendant guy, I'm like, hey, you got a gallon of water? And I literally just get dumped a gallon of water oh. on the starter to cool it because what was I going to do? And it was hilarious because there was a guy on a bike, on a motorcycle. He's like, he's like hey, dude, you're, none of that water is making it in. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, he thought I was filling up the radiator or something. I'm like, yeah, I know, dude. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just cooling off my starter here. Um, but, no, it wor not. but it worked, you know? So yeah. Um, that's awesome. And then later after that, I went to my parents' house for dinner or whatever. And same thing happened. And I grabbed his leaf blower and I pointed the leaf blower at the starter to cool it. Um, yeah. I got a, I got a high torque mini in it now, so it's no, not an issue, but anyway. So that, that's what I'm pointing towards specifically to those models, those years, um, like in the eighties specifically. I've seen that on a lot of different ones Replace, I mean, and with all these answers, guys, don't, we're not spitting gospel here. Okay. So just, I would advise a new starter, you know, but um, like I said, that diagnostic diagnostic trick, I just said, bring the bike back um, after you got it fired up or, you, or put it in that situation where it's not going to run, put a brand new battery, just hook straight up to it and try to fire it again. And, uh, See if it doesn't just crank right up because it has all that extra power that it can just take and go, and go straight to the coils. You might be surprised. It might just go gotcha. and, and fire up, and that, that'd be a great way to, to test it out. Or take a pail of water and dump it all over. <laughs> I'm going to turn my fan on real quick. I'm hot. Hold on. All right. Or, I mean, um, I guess you didn't mention if it's struggling to start. So if the starter is slow if it's a slow crank then yeah i i could see what we're saying makes sense so i guess yeah. a little more information is needed on this yeah um no you're right yeah good one that's a good question yeah all right um, you want to do the next one yeah hey matt and cody he, he left me out oh but, um whatever <laughs> What do you guys think about this? And this is the website, uh, uh, emanualonline.com. This is actually a great question because I actually have a partnership with them. It would be nice if there were a one place where you can go to get manuals for just about for, for anything that you have, motorcycle, car, whatever. But I'm not sure how legit these guys are. Where do you and Cody go, where, where do you and Cody go for your manuals? Also, it seems to me that hands down no brainer solution to cleaning the insides of carbs as easily and thoroughly as possible is an ultrasonic with carb cleaner in it. Okay. What do you guys think about ultrasonics? If you do use them, what liquids do you use? I've heard some people rave about pine salt and to clean carbs. Have either one of you tried that? I, I get it 
that vapor blaster is the best way to do the outside as someone who is very concerned with the environment. I actually prefer simple green formula for aluminum for cleaning the carburetors in my ultrasonic. I also prefer fluid film as a lubricant because it's based on linoleum. Although of course I defer to OEM recommendations for specialized lubrication purposes. I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Um, any other products you guys use to go easier on the environment? Thanks so much for both of you doing this. Keep up the great work, Jeff Cobb. So Jeff Cobb sneaked in two questions on this one. I see how it is. I think it's more than two. Is it? Yeah, it's three. It's it's a whole bunch. <laughs> but but anyway. All right. So right. emails. We'll, we'll try to tackle this. Okay. So Emmanuel Emmanuel online. It's very specific. We'll put it up here. So I actually have a um, a partnership with them. It's not like a like we're best buds, but. Um, they give me some discount codes for people who want to use them. So I'll be sure to put a discount code in here for their website to get a manual for your bike, whatever. So I, I, I've used their product twice. Um, I've heard other people using their product um, after I've had this partnership with them and they've had problem, problems with them. The one thing that I noticed with eManual online is that they do appear to have every manual ever. Okay, and they have and, and they have tons of versions. My advice is that when you pull up the manual for your bike, read the descriptions. Okay, because they are very specific in their descriptions and they're tiny, right? And that's, that's, like, that's like a flaw that I've found with them that they have descriptions and they're different. They may look the same. You may start reading, and the first two lines are similar to other descriptions you've read. Keep reading because it's going to get more specific to say this is a uh, this is a like climbers manual version of this manual or whatever so it's very specific so read that and read all the different versions they'll have like a three dollar one and a 17 dollar one and third i wish it was better i wish it was cleaner i wish that it was just you know bulletproof but it's not i think it's uh, multiple different um places in the world working on one website um so but like I said, I've used their stuff. I had to read the description. It took me a long time to find it, but I got the right one and it was factory manuals. Okay. The problem that I've heard people having is that when they buy the wrong one, they're either not hearing back from them or uh, it's taking a very long time to get their money back or their refund back to say, this is the wrong manual. Like this isn't what I wanted to get. That's, that's one of the cons that I found. I didn't have that problem because I read the description and I ordered my manual. I liked it. And i I paid for it. I didn't get it for free. I bought two manuals from them. Um, so I think it's a great website. Just do your homework on each one. Okay. Um, they, I wish they had pictures that show you what the pages look like, but they don't. So moving on to the second part, what, what do you have to say about this? Uh, well, yeah, let me add to the, the service okay, yeah, manual thing. Yeah, Cause I, I know you work for a dealer, so you're, you're taken care of yes. with so the manuals. I, I have every Honda manual from so, that Honda ever had for a bike that came out in the U S yeah. at the shop. Yeah. So I have the opposite problem. No one gives me manuals. So I got to look for them, <laughs> buy them, whatever. So, so boom, you're in target so, market. Well, yeah. First of all, emmanualonline.com. I think uh, they've reached out to me numerous times uh, to work with them and, you know, try it out and offer discount codes and whatnot. I, I just haven't got around to it because okay. I got other stuff going on. So I just, I just uh, haven't got to it, but um, I have a good blog post on my website on how to find free service manuals. So mm. it's basically how to search for free ones that people post. Okay. So definitely check out that. Uh, we'll put it in the description below. Yep. In the video description. Yep. So, but you're not going to find everything. Okay. And yeah. so the next uh, thing I do is I go to tradebit.com. And they are for purchase. They're up 10 bucks to 30 bucks, depending on what you need. Most of them are around 15 bucks, but uh, I use them all the time and they're factory manuals, 300 pages or whatever. And it's been perfect. I never had an issue with them. Um, so that, that's are those hard I'm, copy or is it all? It's all PDFs. Like, okay. And some of these PDFs are searchable. Some are not. It just really depends okay. on, you know, whatever. Um, that's a but, bummer when it's not searchable. Yeah. That's yeah, like my biggest thing I don't like about online manuals when, when you can't like search. Them. Yeah. Um, and I always try to get the factory manuals. Um, yeah. Some climber manuals are really good. 
and some of them are really horrible. Like some of them are very descriptive. I've had ones where like take off oil pan, put oil pan back on. That that was literally two sentences of how to do that. And it was like, dude, <laughs> you kind of right. missed a few steps. Right. Um, Give me a torque spec or something. <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it was just terrible. So yeah, for sure. I think that's it I have on uh, service manuals. That's how I, I get yeah, by. Yeah, you can also hit up, if it's motorcycle specific, reach out to your, to the, your local dealership because they can order you manuals. And a lot of times they have triples or duplicates of manuals from the shops um, because Honda will send or the company will send you a manual. But just recently, all the, all the dealers started going to online. So they're no longer sending out manuals to dealerships after 2018. It's all online, which kind of sucks, but you can still order one and get one, which means that you, the customer, can do the exact same thing. But you're going to spend about 50 bucks, but it's a factory manual. It's the one that I would use to work on your bike. Also seems so the cleaning the carbs out thoroughly, ultrasonic carb cleaner. Um, so I have an ultrasonic tank um, from Omega, or it's from Ultrasonic. So it's a brand Ultrasonic, and Omega Sonics is the I don't know how they're, it's like a partnership, I guess, or it's like they ultrasonic owns Omega Sonic and it's the cleaner that they use. So I will post in the description. I don't have like a spare bottle near me of what it is. And I just use their brand stuff. Um, it's the best stuff that I've found. I haven't had to go and do a bunch of tests because um, it works so good. And why am I going to spend more money on it? Like Matt's got the same deal. He's got a great yeah. cleaner. Which one do you use? So I, I bought a sharper tech ultrasonic cleaner used on eBay for like a hundred bucks. It's a gallon and a half. It's not very big, maybe two carbs, a bank of two carbs will fit in there, but certainly not a bank of four. Maybe if I do one of these, <laughs> uh, but I, I want a bigger tank for sure, but I just haven't got around to it. My list is pretty long of what I need, uh, but they have this, 1220 carburetor cleaner and degreaser i bought a half gallon five years ago and you can see i, I i'm running low so you dilute four to eight ounces of this per gallon and wow yeah i mean how much uh, Pretty concentrated yeah so your solution how much do you have to so uh, i have a 7.75 gallon tank or something like that wow so uh so a it's, bank of four will fit in there, no problem, right? You just dunk absolutely. it right in. That's I can awesome. Fit, I can probably stack two banks of four, and then it's pretty big. Nice. Um, it's yeah. So what's there's a measurement, right? But I don't know the measurement. <laughs> <laughs> well, more more than four to eight ounces per it's gallon. It's definitely I mean, way more water. And like, so what I do is on the bottom, I use like what I what I was taught at the shop is the bottom level of the thing I do about an inch and then I over the top with water. So an inch of solution over the top. So I think it's like 10 to one or something like that. It's some I high gotcha. number. Okay. Um, I'm, I actually have the, 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 the manual for it. I'll probably put a little description, but it's a high amount because it's super concentrated. And I've had that for ever since I bought it. I've never changed the solution. It's still clear and blue. I've cleaned maybe six or seven carbs through it. So, Oh, wow. But the pine saw stuff is junk. So um, I, I did a video on pine saw just because. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know what it did a good job of? Degreasing the outside. That's yeah. it. I mean, it's, it's not – I just did a video on it to do a video on it. I, mm -hmm. I used it that one time, and I haven't looked back because I got this solution, which works right. great. And you really need heat. Yes. Heat is key to cleaning stuff to any of the cleaners yeah, yeah you know? exactly so i feel I, like all all of them would be nice if you had heat with them yeah um and it but he's good but he's saying ultrasonic with carb cleaner so is he talking like a straight up solvent i, I don't know I, yeah. I don't think you want to do that um first of all it'd be very expensive to find a solvent yes. to put in there and then how do you dispose of it you know yeah that's yeah that would it that's nasty stuff, man. So now, you know, the thing with carb cleaning is it depends what you're dealing with inside the carbs. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with varnish, uh, sometimes I like to use chem dip. Mm -hmm. 
because that breaks down the varnish really good. Um, if you're dealing with rusty junk, crusty junk, I like to blast that off, either dry mm -hmm. soda or the vapor blast. Um, an ultrasonic doesn't work too good on that crusty stuff that you may find in carburetors. Right. I mean, you have to pick at it somehow. Yep. So it all depends on what you're dealing with. Yeah, sometimes the carbs are just too far gone unless you have an awesome vapor hone machine. Hey, man, you can build yeah. one. You can. <laughs> in, the, in the description. <laughs> yeah. Wood, <laughs> harbor freight, whatever you want. Whatever you yeah. want. Yeah. Cool. Cool, man. So I think, I think that's, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, the, the simple green is I found that most people have best, better success with the simple green um, and a water solution. The one takeaway that is a great point from Matt, which is the heat aspect of it, to kind of get it in a big pot, go to the thrift store, buy a big pot, you know, and, and a single burner and uh, get it hot and or just use the Weiss cookware. Who cares? Yeah. Um, and uh, soak them. The thing, the takeaway that I want to provide is just be careful of the length of time. Right, because these chemicals have a very, they can, the pH levels are all jacked up on them, right? And they can jack up what the metal actually looks like. And once it goes that far, unless you have a cool vapor home machine, then you you're definitely vapor blasting them to bring right. back uh, that because finish. Because they yeah. turn dark, like yeah. dark. And they're still usable. It just looks like crap. You right. Know? And it changes the color of the metal, the pot metal, whatever kind of metal they're using to make those car bodies, it jacks it up. So I would say check on it pull them out, wash them off at least every 25 minutes and try to be adamant about that. Yeah. Well, same thing with chem dip. If you leave stuff in there too long, it'll discolor it. So, I mean, wrecks it. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I know there's different types of simple green. There's the regular green formula. And then I think they have like a purple aircraft version. Ooh. I, I, I forget what it's called, but it's safe. They, they claim it's safe for aluminum. Because okay. the, gre the green stuff is not technically, I believe. Ooh, I didn't know that. Okay. Or for long periods. Got it. So, um, I don't know. One of these days, I'm going to try simple green in there. I mean, I'm almost out of this stuff. Maybe I'll try yeah. it, but, you know. Um, cheap. Yeah, How much is sure. the stuff that you have? Yeah, so this stuff for a gallon is like 60, 70 bucks. Okay. That's how so much it, mine is. Yeah. yeah. Expensive, but it works. Right. And... I've had a, a half gallon for like five years. Yeah. So I, I think I'll go with a full gallon next time. But anyway. I think that's it, man. I mean, he took up all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he had one more thing about being concerned about the environment. Well. Okay. Uh, dude, I, I use stuff that's not environmentally friendly. That's for sure. I mean, all the carb cleaners, WD-40, all the solvents. I mean, that stuff is not... Yeah. Environmentally friendly. So I, I don't know how to answer that question. I just wear gloves and I dispose of them properly and that's it, you know? Yeah. Like mo most of the cleaners we're talking about is, um, I think what you have to take into, um, consideration is like the ultrasonic tank and the cleaner that I'm using. That's it's meant like Honda incorporated sells these machines to dealerships, right? So these dealerships, have lots of waste we have oil we have uh coolant we have brake fluid we have all these different things that we have to dispose of every certain amount of time so they're ultimately relying on you to do that safely and if you're buying this stuff for your home diy well you got to figure out the best way to do it maybe you can take it to the dealership and say hey i have this leftover uh chem dip is there any way that you guys get rid of this stuff how do you get rid of it and they may just be like yeah pull it down the toilet well, then just don't listen to them you know yeah um, yeah, I mean, on. I mean, my city has hazardous waste collection once yeah. a year. So mm -hmm. look into that. Um, I mean, I think he's looking for products to use, but I, I, I honestly can't recommend any. I don't know of any, right? right? So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a dirty business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the vapor blaster is environmentally friendly because it's just water and media. Hey so I mean, there you go. <laughs> But yeah. All right, guys. So I think that's all the time we have. Try to answer as many as we can. Again, Matt, what was that email? I think I got it right this time. Askbrokenmoto at gmail.com. Perfect. That's how you get a hold of us. Send us your videos, your pictures, information. Try to follow the rules. 
okay, give us as much information as possible. It's not really a hard set of rules. We'll try to follow ours at the same time. Uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out. Anything you got to plug, Matt? Anything you have going on uh, in your life? No, nothing, nothing too interesting nowadays, but just check out my site, howtomotorcyclerepair.com. Cool. Yeah, mine as well. Uh, the Motorcycle MD. You can follow me on Instagram forward slash The Motorcycle MD. You can check me out there. Um, I try to post stuff daily of me working in the shop and whatnot. But until then, we'll see you guys next time. All right. See ya. Thanks, guys. Later.